everyone, and welcome to the Any Monday Podcast. My name is Colin Hemphill. And I'm Kayla Hemphill. On our show, we roll the virtual dice each week and must watch a randomly selected anime title. Thanks for joining us. We're back with our regular show. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, we did have fun with our special Any Monday Origins episodes, and we hope you enjoyed them. Yeah, that was a lot of fun for us, and it's given us a lot of fun ideas for the future. Well, several weeks ago, we rolled the virtual dice on Crunchyroll, and the anime that transformed into this week's episode is called Planet With. You heard that correctly. It is Planet With, W-I-T-H. This series began as a manga in April of 2018, and it's still going on today. And the 12-episode anime adaptation that we watched released only a few months later in July of 2018. That's a really fast turnaround. It is. I don't quite know how they did that. Yeah, that seems weird. It might have been a simultaneous sort of thing, like they were working on both properties at the same time, but not something you see very often. No. Kayla, would you like to share the plot with us? When a giant UFO appears above Japan, seven individuals psychically link with powerful armor in order to defend the planet from the invader. A high school student named Soya unwittingly finds himself at the center of this battle, but his enemy is not the UFO. Rather, his enemy is the pilots who seek to destroy it. Okay, I think this show, we might benefit from talking a little bit about the story before we get into the characters. There's a lot going on. There is. um, A surprising amount of things going on. Yeah, for the first four episodes... Things kept happening. (laughs) (laughs) Um, In a way that wasn't terribly overwhelming. It didn't seem like it was throwing too much at us, but there is a lot of ground to cover here. So I I guess kind of the biggest part is that this is all about this war that is going on on this planet, which I assume is Earth. Yeah, they've said it's Earth. Okay. Um, But it's not the only planet involved in this whole ordeal. Uh, The first group is called the Nebulans. And they are split into two factions. One is the pacifist faction and the other is the sealing faction. And while those two groups have the same end goal, they have different means of kind of accomplishing it. That part's a little bit fuzzy to me. Um, One, it seems like we're going to solve it with love. And the other one is like, we're going to solve it with giant machines. (laughs) Yeah, that part started getting revealed towards the third and fourth episode. So I think there's more to unpack than we got to see. And uh, the ceiling faction who uses these big UFO things that you mentioned in the synopsis um, are kind of the most direct enemies of the Grand Paladin. And the Grand Paladin is made up of pilots of these like mech robot psychic suit things. And they fight the big weapons, the big UFOs that the ceiling faction sends out. We we kind of got introduced to all seven of those pilots a little bit, some of them more than others, and then they also have this kind of mysterious leader guy who we don't know much about. No, it's kind of interesting because it seems like this is the first time that there's been invaders, but these pilots have been around for longer because they end up talking about how they either left previous jobs or something in order to do this. So they've been around for a while for some reason that we're not sure what they were doing before the invaders came. About all we really know about the way that they work is that each of the pilots carries around a vial on their neck that has some sort of magic that is associated with a dragon. It looks like dust. Yeah. Uh, We know that there is a dragon or there are dragons in this world. Um, We don't really know what they are or what their purpose is, but they seem to be destructive and kind of, these are, these are wild dragons. They're not like reasoned with nice dragons. I have theories as to what the dragons are and why they happen because they, they don't exist upon themselves. They come out of these people who use this magic. Yeah. In one of the later episodes that we watched, we saw one of the pilots kind of rage into the form of a dragon that the rest of the pilots had to keep at bay and then eventually talk her down back into her human form. Mm -hmm. 
I have to say that these pilots remind me of the Power Rangers. Yeah, there is there is a certain Power Ranger sort of vibe going on. So let's talk about this for a second. They each have their own designated animal armor thing. Right. So far, we have not seen them all merge together, so I'm waiting for that. Um, but when they fly off, they each have their own color, which is a thing that was done in the Power Rangers a lot. And so it kind of has that vibe of like, there's these, well, they're not all young, but there's these, you know, fighters who are out there and they're all joined together by, well, usually Zordon. I don't know how the new Power Rangers, I don't know if it's still the same person. And Zordon's the one that like sends them on their mission. And they kind of have that character in their lives. They have like their leader who's also powerful in his own right. And he's guiding these pilots to fight. That's the part that we're uncertain about why they were brought together in the first place because it doesn't seem like there was any danger beforehand. So it's a little shady. And and something that is interesting with this war is that all three of these factions that are going on, the Grand Paladins and then the Pacifist and the Sealers, are all actually trying to accomplish the same thing, but through different means. And I think it's interesting that this story is going there because nobody actually wants destruction. All three of these groups seem to want peace, but they all have different ways of going about it. And I am finding that very interesting with all of the characters because they're all so incredibly biased about which way is the best way to achieve that, and that's why they're fighting. And I think that is far more interesting than who's the good guy and who's the bad guy because, in essence, they're all kind of good and they're all kind of bad. Yeah, like the kind of who strikes you as the initial enemy is the ceiling faction because they're sending out giant weapons is what they call them. But these weapons aren't like destroying things. They're they're in really weird forms. They come in like a big teddy bear. A big teddy bear. There's like a, a baby. A parade of upside down babies. <laughs> it's so weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the seven pilots from the the Grand Paladin will go out to fight this thing, and they're not even like shooting weapons or you know missiles or guns at it. They're like going inside it to try to basically like will power themselves over the core of the machine. The the other faction that we kind of spend the most time with, the pacifist faction, they don't really do anything. Like they're they're not a hundred percent aligned with the ceiling faction, so they don't care about the machines, but they also are like trying to keep the Grand Paladin from destroying the machines. And the only time that we see like actual destruction is when the dragon appears. Mm-hmm. And that is a common enemy who is causing harm to everyone. And they all immediately gather around that mission of taking down the dragon. Yeah, and that's what's so interesting is because it really seems like the pacifist group is trying to prove that people are capable of love and that is such a hard thing to show and I think that's why we don't see much from them because they're just trying to show that humans are capable of choosing love over power that's that's kind of a theme that they keep saying and so it seems like they're trying to create situations in which humans will choose to love one another over choosing great power. So there is one member of the pacifist faction who is kind of struggling with that idea. He seems to have a lot of hatred for the people he's fighting, and that is our main character, Soya, who, say it with me, has amnesia. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, for this show, I really feel like they handled his amnesia really well. Because they handled it from a mental health standpoint. We don't know fully what happened. He witnessed something extremely traumatic. And his brain shut it off. Which is something that actually can happen to people. We call it repression. So that's what happens to him. And when he gets triggered with the memory, 
he gets everything back. He totally remembers what happened. And he's like, okay, now I know where I am. And it's interesting to me because he didn't do what I see a lot of shows do when somebody suddenly comes back from their amnesia, which is information dump. He doesn't talk about what led to his amnesia. He doesn't talk about the traumatic event. He just says, I know who I am now. I remember everything. I know what my mission is. Which is great because the people he's with already know all of that information. So it wouldn't make sense for him to dump information on them. And I was just really impressed by the way that they actually chose to go in a narrative way that would make sense for that character. Yeah, all, all we really know about the past events um, is that it involves a dragon. He has a bone pick with dragons. It seems because there was some sort of destruction on the planet that he was from. Oh, by the way, he's an alien. Yeah, that one got dropped in. Um, and so when he realizes that these other pilots are using dragon power to overcome their enemies, uh, he's like, okay, I'm good. Now I'm now that I'm kind of thrown into the middle of this war, like I'm OK fighting these enemies. Um, and the way that he fights them is he basically like removes their power. He's not trying to kill them or anything. No, he doesn't even really seem to harm them, just outmaneuvers them enough to strip them of their power. Some of these pilots he even eventually meets. He goes to school with them and he's like, I like this is a friend of mine. I just don't want them to fight for this cause. Like, they're using power that they shouldn't be, and I'd rather they just not do that. Uh, another just little quirky thing about him is for reasons unbeknownst to us, he is obsessed with meat. Um, his whole diet, for some reason, we don't know if it's intentional or not, is vegetarian. And it's like his his quest to have a dish that has meat in it. And it's mostly used for comedic effect, but I find it amusing. Yeah, the running gag being that he's constantly on the verge of eating a meat dish when it is, for some reason, taken away from him. Uh, my personal favorite is when he thought he was going to get a, a meat bun and he goes to bite into it and it's a red bean uh -huh. <laughs> <He> No! <laughs> That one was good. So the reason that Soya is kind of doing this thing is that after his whole ordeal and he had this amnesia spell, he is taken in by two people, and I use people lightly, <laughs> who he lives with and they kind of take care of him and they introduce him to this whole battle that's going on. Uh, one of those is Sensei. <laughs> and sensei is a big purple cat yeah like larger than the average human like w what you would expect if somebody were in a big cat costume as a mascot but like weirdly skinny yeah big big head very skinny body yep and it only meows yeah <laughs> um it has no like english communication for most, for the most part, and we kind of come to find out that this cat thing is like the leader of the pacifist faction. And at one point, and we alluded to this when we originally rolled this show, there is also a race of dog creatures. Yeah, <laughs> that and, look like Snoopy. And they are the other faction. The ceiling faction. Of the nebula. Mm -hmm. So they both are part of the same group, but they're like, they have different views on things. And at one point they hold this summit where they talk about agreements they have come to and, and things like that. Which it's interesting because they do refer to each other as like either black and white or dark and light. Mm -hmm. And the pacifist is the dark colored one. And the ceiling is... It's like a white dog, but their colors are like opposite of how they describe each other. Also, the dog looks like Snoopy. I'm going to keep saying that. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess the, the other thing to know about Sensei is that he is the mech. Yes. Uh, when Soya needs to fight, the cat will like eat him. Yep. 
and then turn into a mech. Yep. And that's how he fights. Yep. And it's a cat mech, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Additionally, he has a spaceship. <laughs> that's also a really big cat. It's just a giant version of him. I know. It's the exact same, but it's like mountain sized. It's the best. Same color and everything. Also, I should note, this cat is not highly detailed, so it's... No, it's it's a very anime-like, yeah. simple cat. Yeah. Uh, the other character that is sort of like the assistant to Sensei is Ginko. And she looks human enough. We're not really sure what she is. No. Not human, but not whatever Soya is. A maid. Is that like her race of being? Yeah. Okay, sure. Maid race. Well... She translates for Sensei, um, since he can't or doesn't communicate, I guess in that instance, Japanese, but for us, English. Right. And um, that's pretty much all she does. She's just kind of there as a guide and as a helper and as a translator. She does, as whatever, whatever she is, she does appear to have some sort of psychic abilities as well. We don't know if that's probably not dragon powered. But we have no idea. Uh, she's seen, like, grabbing a person and she's able to levitate and, like, fly into the sky. She's very floaty. Yeah, and stuff like that. Uh, the only other person I would point out is Nozomi, which is one of Soy's classmates. Uh, at, like, the very beginning of the show, we're introduced to her. And they are, I guess, friends. He doesn't really seem to know anything about her, though. She's the class rep. Yeah. So she's taken it upon herself to be his friend. Yep. And she also brings him into the Occult Research Club. Which is something we actually see a lot in anime. And I think almost until this show, I didn't fully know what that meant. It does not just mean witchcraft the way that it does here in the States. Um, it's sort of any supernatural anything. So it could be like cryptids, ghosts, UFOs. Yep. Anything that X kind files of stuff. yeah yeah anything and everything that falls into that. So that was something I actually learned from the show. I guess the the only thing I can say otherwise about Nozomi is that I don't know what her role is in this show. She doesn't really seem to have any kind of purpose so far. I also have a theory about this. Okay. I think she is going to be the human for Soya to care about because he's not human. And right now he's pretty upset at humans for using dragon power. And I think she is going to be this kind of pure person in his life to like get him really on board with the pacifist mission because he kind of is leaning towards being... Like the sealers, but that's not proven. Also, just as a, a result of her being, I guess, the, the president of the occult club is that she's just like researching all the stuff that he's doing uh, behind the scenes. So she's probably going to end up finding out stuff that he doesn't want her to know. And they're going to be best friends. Mm -hmm. yep. She's going to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to take a real quick break. Alright, welcome back. So we're now at the point of the show where we talk about all the fun animation and production kind of stuff. Kayla, do you have any thoughts on all of the production? So something I want to start with is the character designs. I thought initially that I was going to super hate the character designs because they seemed really goofy and it didn't really seem to have a purpose. It was just like, ah, look how like goofy and weird we can be and I was just like okay whatever um like the main character he has what 
what I would normally call an ahoge, but it's kind of shaped like a lightning bolt. Um, and his eyes were very pink. And then there's the cat. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different characters that have strange looks to them. And as the show progressed, they actually revealed that there's a purpose behind them because they're aliens. And it's interesting to see that, like, have a purpose Like, the cat thing made sense. I was like, okay, clearly, like, the cat has to be something. But even the main character looking strange for a human made sense now because he was not human. He's some sort of alien. And there's other characters that also have these weird kind of, they look like humans, but they have these weird traits. You mentioned the leader of the Grand Paladins. He has, like, cat eyes and lightning bolt eyebrows. And I just thought he was like a weird looking dude. But now I'm starting to think like he's something. I don't know what he is, but he's something. Yeah, because pretty much the only normal looking people are all the grand paladins. And the class rep. Yeah, and the the students. Yeah. Uh, None of them have any like weird visual characteristics. They all just kind of look like normal anime characters. Um. You've got the cat, but you also have Ginkgo, who has a cat mouth. Yeah. And wears a maid outfit for no reason. Uh, yeah, she also has green hair. Yeah, and there there aren't a whole lot of other, like, weird hair colors besides that. Yeah, there's one of the pilots that has pink hair, but... Mm-hmm. So, other than the way that the characters are designed, which I was really impressed by how much purpose they put behind that... The overall animation of the show is clean and well done, but they don't really do anything else that's impressive or that stands out in any way. Um, There's some computer animation that seems to blend well. It's not jarring or disruptive in any way, but so far I haven't seen anything else that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, it was it was made in 2018, and it doesn't seem like a low-budget production, but it seems like, you know, they put the manga out in one month, and then three months later, they put the anime out. So I don't, I don't know what kind of time restraints they were working with. Um, it seems fine. It's like you said, uh, some of the mech fights are a little awkward, but otherwise, uh, not too bad. Um. So I think that will kind of push us into talking about some of the music that's going on in this show. So I don't really have anything to say about the music, but I do want to talk about something that we've never talked about before. Okay. Which is the sound design. Oh, okay. I'm ready. Uh, This show is the only show I've seen as part of Andy Monday so far, where the sound design is really noteworthy. There's a lot of weird kind of stuff going on between, like, dragons being in this kind of, like, weird sci-fi fantasy universe. You've got cat and dog people. You've got mech fights with psychic abilities and things like that. And what I what I found pretty interesting was that they use some really unique sound effects for all of this stuff that seems to be really well-intentioned and pretty expertly designed. Um, You know, it's hard to say how much of it was, like, pulled from libraries and how much of it was original, but whoever was putting all this stuff together uh, put in a lot of effort to make every, like, impact and every roar of a dragon and every, like, power-up to a move uh, pretty interesting. And it stood out, too, because I think a lot of times in shows when we're trying to listen for the sound design is it sort of kept at the same volume level that everything else is kept at. And in this show, they really put it at the forefront. It is quite loud, uh, which for me was jarring at first. Like I I wanted to go and like turn the TV down because suddenly there were very loud explosions and, um, But as I got used to the show, it was like, wow, it's like you were saying, you could really feel the impact of what was happening on screen. Yeah, this is something that 
TV shows typically don't do as much because they expect you to be watching on crappy TV speakers um, is really play with dynamic range. So a lot of movies will have a lot of dynamic range to them um, because they're expecting you to watch this in a theater that has a high-end sound system, and that's all that's playing in that theater. There's no distracting noises outside of, uh, outside of it. Uh, so when you get home and you put it in your home theater system or you put it on your TV, there's a lot of compression that happens to limit that kind of stuff. So I actually went back and like listened to this on my high-end headphones. I think they made bad mix choices, actually. Oh, so it was okay that I wanted to turn the volume down. <laughs> uh, like, we're talking when we were listening to this on crappy TV speakers, it like distorted them to the point of it sounding like it was going to break. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I, I went and listened on headphones and like, while you can, you can hear everything, the dialogue isn't like drowned out by the sound effects. It was extremely loud in places that mm -hmm. made it feel awkward. Okay. So I think somebody was very proud of their sound effects <laughs> and just kind of put them in the wrong spots in the mix on occasion. Okay, fair enough. Um, one thing that I want to talk about was the, is actually the timing of the music that was there. There's a couple scenes in particular that I really want to bring out. And that is when the pilots are fighting against the creatures, the UFOs. Oh, when they're floating in the sky, there's a lot of battle music going on and it's, kind of like fast paced and it's it's what you would think of just average normal battle music and a singular pilot will go into the core of the ufo and that's when they start having this sort of dream sequence and the music changes immediately it becomes much softer it becomes more pleasant and as they're going through the dream sequence inevitably the pilot will like disengage from the dream and and say something along the lines of, like, I have to, like, let this end. I have to, like, defeat this UFO. And they'll, like, put on their armor, and that'll, like, shatter the core. And as the core is shattering, it goes silent. And it the silence is paired with this black screen with white text on it that says something that is supposed to be taken, like, pretty powerfully. And the first time it just seemed kind of strange and I didn't really make much note of it, but it kept happening. And I started piecing together like, okay, this is something I need to really pay attention to. And I love that it was done with the music, that that silence really emphasized what that short, it's like a one sentence message was trying to say. And I I was really impressed with the show that it did that, that it decided to not only play with the sound design, but also the soundtrack to make it stand out in that way. Yeah, all of those production elements that kind of went into the, the core shattering sequences really stood out, especially because everything kind of around it with the like cats and the weird babies and all of this stuff that leads up to it, you see this stuff and you're like, oh, this show is actually trying to say something. And it picked a very strange backdrop for it. But, uh, like, I'm actually connecting to this character in this moment. Yeah, and it's something, like you said, you don't anticipate when you just kind of jump into this show. And it's, it's bizarre, <laughs> all the stuff that's in it. And yet the really powerful short messages that it's dropping in there for you that you can really latch onto really quickly 
which leads me into wanting to talk a little bit about our kind of general thoughts on the show to wrap things up, which, in my opinion, is that this show is so stupid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's so dumb. Uh, like, thinking back to the first time I saw the giant cat spaceship, <laughs> it's like, what is... This is right after all of these these shattering sequences where like all of this deep character development had just happened and you're like, what is the the cat and and <laughs> what <laughs> And then they complete the summit with the dog race and you're like, uh, okay. <laughs> they're all fighting for love, but they're they have these weapons and they're big babies and <laughs> they're I don't I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, the world building is nonsense, and yet they're using it in effective ways somehow. <laughs> but I think what really sells it is that they play it all totally straight. Yeah, they're not they're not doing it to like make fun of anything. They're like, this is the world. Here it is. Enjoy it. So like Kayla mentioned, there is one joke in the whole show, and that's that he can't eat meat. <laughs> That's the joke. Yeah. The rest of the stuff, the cats and the dogs and the babies and the spaceships and the aliens and the occult research club and all of this weird stuff is totally real and legit and it's important and it's dangerous and we're going to fight. <laughs> like the 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 cat eating the main character to turn into a <laughs> mech pilot. That's not even the best one. The best part is that in order to make his suit more powerful, he has to get drunk or he has to deal with a hangover the next day. <laughs> he basically drinks a Red Bull. Uh, <laughs> the The dragon takes off into the air and, and Soya's like, can you turn into, can you grow wings or something? We need to go get it. And he's like, no, no, we can't. We can't. It's too powerful. Can't do it. <laughs> and he's like, surely you can. And he says, fine, fine, but tomorrow's going to be terrible. <laughs> and they chug this, like, mysterious can of something and have a hangover in the next day. It's amazing. But the show, like, plays with intergalactic politics and war and it does it all with a straight face. And what the viewer is actually seeing is so incredibly stupid that you just can't help but laugh. But you are able to buy what they're selling better, I think, because all of the backdrop is so weird. I think what makes it so approachable is that sometimes it's just hard to get into a show that's really heavy, that's very serious, that's not always why you come to anime. And there are shows that totally do it well. Um, like, I think of shows like like Full Metal Alchemist does that really well, but a lot of shows don't. And I think this show decided, instead of trying to do a show that maybe just, that might just be boring to people, is let's give them something to talk about, but also something that'll stand out. And a big purple cat stands out. Yeah, because it's like, how many hyper-melodramatic mech shows have we seen already as part of Annie Monday? Yeah, they all just blur together. And none of them were successful at it because they didn't have the nuance, they didn't have the characters, they, they were lacking something or a whole bunch of things. Yeah. So instead, this show decided... You know, let's focus on our characters and have, like, nuanced characters and introduce these kind of poignant backstories to them. And let's introduce some gray morality, but also they're cats and dogs and he eats the main character <laughs> and all of this stuff. And it allows you to kind of disconnect with the, the like, over-serious drama and be able to appreciate a little bit more what they're trying to say. Uh, 
that kind of goes into some of the thoughts that I wanted to share. It kind of, as, as we've been talking about it, I keep thinking of the movie Paprika um, for the same sort of thing as if you watch some of the dream sequences in Paprika, it's bizarre and weird, but things are still being said. And this kind of felt like that. Um, the hallucination, dream, whatever sequences you want to call them when the pilots are in the cores are very interesting um, because it's a direct challenge to what they're thinking these creatures are. Um, so they're going in thinking these people are invaders and we have to destroy them. And when they enter into the core, the core gives them their fantasy, whatever it is, that, that thing that they're trying to accomplish, whether it's the apology that they weren't able to give or being able to surpass their teacher or to be able to express their love for another person. And these pilots, because of their bias, they're like, oh, I, ha I have to... I have to destroy this. And that's when that one sentence thing comes in and it and it validates whatever that fear is. So it'll say something like, um, like no one's afraid of you, like you don't have to worry about that or something like that. And it's this very gentle, loving response. And it's interesting to see these pilots react so negatively and then never talk about it again. Because in the very first episode, the very first people to encounter these UFOs were normal military pilots. And one of those pilots flies into the core and he has like a hallucination thing and it has to do with his family. And the family's talking about how excited they are to bring in a new baby and how glad they are that that the husband is going to like be safe and be able to grow up or, you know, be able to watch their kids grow up. And when he leaves the core and the core is totally fine and he's totally fine, he has an emotional reaction and he's like telling the other military pilots, he's like, I'm going home. Like, I'm done. And I want to see more of whatever's happening with this because it seems very interesting to me that there's some sort of bias that is being played out. There's a purpose to these invaders coming in and challenging these humans and these humans not responding in a loving way. And I know that that's part of it. I don't know how, but I know it's part of it. And I'm so interested, maybe because this is like getting really close to my field and watching people like have to deal with these kind of fears and realities. I just want to see more of it. <laughs> I'm very I'm very curious as to what's happening and how this could either play out really well and in the human's favor or or horribly horribly wrong. So that's a no for you then. <laughs> you got me. Uh so I guess our final question, would you watch <laughs> more of this? It would be a yes for you. Yes, it would be a yes. I'm I'm very interested in where this is going to go. Um I am not bothered by the weirdness. Once I started figuring out that there was intention behind it, I was totally on board at that point. At first, it felt very weird, and I felt disconnected, and I was like, ugh, what is going to be this weird show? And once I understood the purpose and intention behind it, I'm totally sold. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Uh, I'm also a yes, and for a lot of the same reasons... I think overall I'm just oddly drawn to it, and I think that's what the show is trying to do. And so far it's pulled that off well, and I, I'm interested to see how it progresses through the rest of the episodes. Oh, man, we rarely get a, a two yeses. Yeah. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> and it happened on a mech show. <laughs> also, also strange. Speaking of mech shows, we have a... An announced date for Evangelion coming uh, out on Netflix. Why do you have to spoil this good time with that nonsense? I am glad that it's much further out than I thought it was. I was thinking it would be April, so I have a few more months of freedom. Dealing with the licensing for that show is never on time. 
I'm just saying we may not be fully there yet. They may delay it even more. Supposedly June. But on the other hand, we do have two good pieces of information that we want to share with you. One is look out for the Annie Monday store coming Woo! soon. We've uh, mentioned it a couple times, but yeah. we've got some merch coming, and uh, we would love for you to take a look at it. And uh, we'll let you know when that's available. Yeah. And the really exciting piece is that we are going to have our own panel at Anime CTX. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be doing this show live for the very first time. Uh, we'll do the Anime Monday podcast um, at the Anime CTX convention here in Austin. Woo! We don't uh, have the details on it yet, but uh, you can assume that Anime CTX is happening May 24th through the 26th, which is Memorial Day weekend. So if you are in the Austin area and you want to come see us live, then uh, mark that on your calendars and badges are available now. So you can uh, go ahead and book those and join us at the convention. Guys, we're so excited. Yeah, uh, we've been looking at a couple conventions to see if we can do some live shows. And uh, Anime CTX is a great convention in town, and we thought it would be a good place to start. And they were gracious enough to host us. Yeah. All right. Well, if you want to learn more or see just kind of what's going on, uh, you can visit our website at anamonday.moe. That's anamonday.moe. You can send us questions and comments to podcast at anamonday.moe. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our username is Cast, and you can find links for that on our website. Thank you so much to Crunchyroll for all of the anime that you provide and for the random button, which produces these wonderful and wonderfully terrible results. Wonderful! Woohoo! If you want to follow along with us each week, you'll find a link to the current title on our website and social media so you can watch what we're watching. Finally, thanks to C2A for providing the intro and outro music for our show, which are from his... Senpai EPs, which are available on Bandcamp and other major streaming services. I'll provide links to his music in the show notes and on our website. Are you ready to roll? I'm ready. All right. Random button in three, two, one. Our show for the week is Our Home's Fox Deity. <laughs> talk about this um and the first episode is called our fox deity unsealed that's hilarious we were just talking about this there's a lot of these shows i just <laughs> don't know that i've seen any of them no yeah but how interesting all right well this will be a different change of pace for us yeah uh looking forward to it and uh thank you all for joining us we're excited to see you in person Woo! Uh, again, keep a lookout on our social media and we'll let you know when things are happening. Yeah, we'll see you all soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. I'm going to make weird noises every time that you talk so you can't edit them out. And Kayla's microphone got muted the whole <laughs> episode. Again, why do you feel like you can replace me? <laughs> I'll program Hatsune Miku to Don't you? To replace <laughs> You're going to you. replace me with a Vocaloid? Yeah, I'll just take the transcript of... Oh my gosh.